Okay, hello everyone, and a very warm welcome to today's IIED debates, where we're looking at climate adaptation and disaster resilience budgeting and expenditure. My name is Juliette, I'm the events officer at IIED, and I will be providing some tech support as we go through. That's it from me on housekeeping. Um, so I would now like to introduce our moder moderator for today's event, um, Paul Steele, who is uh, IIED's chief economist. Paul, over to you, please. Thanks, Juliet, and apologies, but for the purpose of this uh, um, webinar, I'm actually invisible because my camera is not working, but you can hear my voice, so I am here, I promise you. So um, we have a really exciting session today. I just want to, uh, as Juliet says, encourage you to introduce yourself in the chat. A number of people are doing that. We've got people from Lagos, people from Guatemala already introducing themselves people from Germany. So just send a message to everyone or hosts and panelists, and, uh, and then we can see where you are. There will, as Juliet said, be translation into Spanish and English. So please uh, select the translation interpretation button at the bottom if you want the interpretation. And then just to give a bit of context before uh, Mathieu launches in, this is about budgeting. Uh, those of you who work in finance will know that budgets are crucial and uh, because they're the key instrument of government policy. And then we're trying to address, uh, hopefully in the audience of this set webinar, three communities who don't often talk to each other. That's uh, obviously the disaster community, uh, the climate community and the finance community. So the idea of this debate series of IID is very much to, pr to, pr to promote debate. And in this case, it's a very lively debate between those three different communities. But I'll stop there and hand over to Mathieu from UNDRR. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Paul, and, and good morning, uh, good afternoon uh, to, to everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. Um, I don't know why I'm seeing a black screen, so I hope you are you can you can see can me. You, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> can you see me? Can you see me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Great. Um, no, and thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, I'd like to maybe just start uh, this webinar um, by uh, by acknowledging um, the the work that we have been doing with many organizations who are presented today. Uh, because we, it's, it's been a joint effort, um, obviously led by IIED, but together with a lot of uh, UN uh, members uh, uh, from the UN system, uh, governments official and international organizations. So I just wanted to start by acknowledging uh, um, their contribution to this work that we are we are discussing today. Um, so I am based in the in the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, uh, UNDRR, and we are the the focal point of the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction. And the Sendai Framework, as as most of you probably know, is the major international agreement on disaster risk reduction that was uh, agreed on uh, in 2015, and uh, which is one of the milestone agreement of the UN and with, with the Paris Agreement, with the, uh, the, uh, the Agenda for Sustainable Development. Um, and in this agreement, um, one of the priority that governments have recognized is the importance of investing in disaster risk reduction. And, and they specifically mention uh, their uh, desire to encourage policymakers to, uh, to allocate a budget for disaster risk reduction and to really mainstream disaster risk reduction in, in public policies. And so this is why we uh, as UNDR started engaging on this work, which is about, uh, as Paul was mentioning, about how do you measure, track uh, money flowing into uh, disaster risk reduction? And, um, and from from a public point of view, from a government uh, perspective, and and this is this is really key uh, because we are today facing a really a dual reality. And one reality is that uh, the number and the severity and frequency of disasters is increasing uh, very rapidly. Uh, we see that from the example from, from flooding in Pakistan, from earthquake in, in Turkey and Syria, from the wildfires uh, in California and Australia. And, and we at UNDR uh, are estimating that the number of disaster uh, will increase by 40%, 40 percent, four zero, uh, between 2015 and 2030. So we are really seeing an increasing uh, frequency of, of those disasters with, of course, dramatic uh, consequences 
on on human lives um and but also on on the economic uh the economies of of countries hit by those disasters so so there is really a need to to step up uh, our work in 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 really trying to prevent this disaster or, um and prevent hazards to to transform into disasters and and so that's one of the reality we're facing the second reality we're facing is that the the investment that are uh, geared towards um disaster risk reduction is, is largely insufficient. And again, if I want to use one example, uh, if we look at the uh, the share of official development assistance, uh, ODA, that is allocated to disaster risk reduction, um, it's actually a tiny bit. Only 1% of ODA is allocated to disasters and a much vast majority of uh, this 1% is for uh, emergency and response, and only uh, a small fraction, 4% of this 1% uh, is for uh, prevention and preparedness. So it gives you a sense of, of how little actually uh, is allocated to this priority. And, and there is a question of why this is happening and why uh, we are not seeing higher, higher investment in, in, this, in this space. And one of them is because, of course, from a political point of view, uh, uh, sometimes it might be tempting to uh, prioritize investment that are more uh, visible, uh, like new infrastructure or, or that are really urgent needs that you have to face. Uh, while investing in disaster reduction is very important, but it's less visible and has positive impact in, in the long run. So it does not have uh, immediate visible impact, although very important long-term impact. And so that's one of the reasons why uh, there is a risk that in the, uh, investment in disaster risk reduction is under-prioritized. Um, and we know from, uh, from studies that it's actually not uh, the best way to spend money because money spent on prevention is actually um, uh, leads to a lot of uh, positive benefit over time. So we, for instance, on infrastructure resilience, one dollar invested in infrastructure resilience is expected to lead to four dollars of benefits down the line. So there is a very a strong business case of why we should invest, uh, but this is this is not uh, happening uh, at the level that that we should we should be seeing. And we think that this uh, tool that uh, and this work that we are doing with, with IAD um, can help address part of this issue, trying to see uh, measuring uh, how much of the budget is allocated to disaster risk reduction has uh, the potential to really make sure that disaster risk reduction are at the, at the core and are, uh, are well considered when governments are actually preparing their budget, uh, making uh, budget allocation decisions. Um, that can help to identify where money is not being invested, where they should be invested. Um, it can help also um, facilitate the, the discussion with government partners, like development partners, to mobilize um, additional investment for, for, for disaster risk reduction. And, and so I think that's where this, uh, this tool is, is particularly important that we are, we're discussing today. And, and I'm really looking forward uh, to, the, to the discussion today with you uh, to, to really advance this work. And, and so with this, I guess I am handing back over to, uh, to you, Paul, uh, for, for the very interesting panel that, that we have to, today. And, and again, thank you for, for uh, all of you that are participating today in, in this in this webinar. Thank you. Great, thanks, Mathieu. And maybe I could ask um, Juliet to just share the slide with our panelists. So yes, we have a very esteemed panel, uh, Son Mi Choi um, with uh, Daza Climate Specialist. Um, then we have uh, Lena, who's a disaster specialist, and Yassine, who's a public financial management specialist. And they'll be presenting first uh, on the work that we have been doing with you and DRR support. Then we have from government, uh, Nazira Dista from the uh, uh, Mozambique's Ministry of uh, Economy and Finance. And then hopefully Xavier Pava Sanchez from the uh, National Unit of Disaster Risk Management in Colombia. So with that, I'm going to invite the audience of which we have uh, over 100 people, about 114 people to, um, to answer the question um, of, of the 40 countries reviewed for this project, how many do you think are, inter are engaged in integrating disaster risk reduction and climate adaptation approaches? So you can tick one box 
either four countries out of 40, either 13 countries out of 40, or 24 countries out of 40, or 36 countries out of 40. And I should say, in order to, the hosts and panelists cannot vote in case they know the answer. Uh, but uh, please uh, tick the box and we'll give the answers in a minute. So you have a couple of minutes now to just think about that. To what extent are countries making this integration, which um, Mathieu mentioned, which needs to take place as much as possible to, uh, to have a coherent response to both climate and disasters. Juliet, can you see how many, have we got a quorum of responses? Yeah, we've had about 60% uh, of people have responded and it's slowing down a little bit now. So perhaps I'll end the poll and we can uh, share and discuss those results. Great, please do. Okay, so 21% uh, of people said it was four countries that have integrated climate and disaster strategies. 48% uh, said 13 countries, so almost half. Then a quarter said 24 and 6% said 36. So the right answer was 13 out of the 40 countries. So half the audience got it right. But the more important point is that um, only uh, about a quarter of the countries that we reviewed are actually integrating climate and disaster strategies. So there's clearly a long way to go on this, uh, on this uh, conversation and debate. So we'll be looking about how to advance that in the course of the, uh, the next hour or so. So with it, without further delays, I'm going to invite Sonmi, uh, Yasin and Lina to make um, their presentation on the work we've been doing. Sonmi will kick off with 10 minutes on a paper that we've just published. Then Yasin will talk about a methodology for taking work forward in your country. I see we have a number of people working all over the world and then Lena will talk about what we're calling a taxonomy, but is essentially a, a set of definitions for how to classify disaster and climate expenditure. But Sonmi, over to you to kick off. Great. Thank you, Paul. Just to check, can you hear me clearly? Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, Matthew, and thank you for all the participants for joining. The issue paper, as you can see the cover page here, uh, we have just launched. This is actually a result of really collective effort with over uh, 10 experts across Africa, Asia Pacific, Europe, Central Asia, and Latin America and the Caribbean. And obviously with huge thanks to valuable input from the country representatives and the technical advisory board members we have consulted for this study. So as you can see, we zoomed in on public finance, climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction. And we provide an overview of the latest global and country level trends in tagging budgets and tracking public expenditures on climate and disaster resilience. As we have already um, seen, disaster and climate risks are rapidly increasing. We are seeing some impacts now, unprecedented level of impacts and irreversible in many parts of the world. We need to accelerate comprehensive climate and disaster risk management at a greater speed and scale. For this, we urgently need adequate, predictable, and coordinated disaster and climate change adaptation finance. Given the importance of public finance for climate and disaster resilience, we need to improve the data on the availability, the quality, and effectiveness of public finance on disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation. So we started by reviewing the commonalities, overlaps, as well as differences between disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation. And we have seen that despite many significant commonalities, there are disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation CCA communities have developed risk assessment and risk management approaches and financing mechanisms mostly separately from each other. So there is very limited evidence of achieving coherence between DRR and climate change adaptation on the ground. However, we, as we see that there is an increasing call for an integrated approach to DRR and climate change adaptation. So we looked at the global frameworks that are related to DRR and CCA, and we note that there is a progress, there has been progress in defining, measuring, and reporting DRR and climate change adaptation related finance and actions 
as we could see, from, for instance, from the work of the UNFCC Standing Committee on Finance, OECD.Rio, as well as DRR policy markers, and the EU taxonomy on Climate Delegated Act. However, while we, we know there's a lot of progress uh, made in advancing climate or green budget tagging and tracking, there is no currently no standard definition or widely used methodology for coordinated or integrated climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction budget tagging and tracking. Despite all the uh, commonalities and overlaps that we have uh, just uh, touched upon earlier uh, between climate change adaptation and DRR. In addition, we also note that climate adaptation finance has gained a huge importance at the national level. However, we see that DRR finance, disaster risk reduction related finance, has uh, no clearly defined or quantified global targets for the international community. After taking stock of the global and regional level frameworks and trends, we examined over 40 country experiences in tagging budgets and tracking public expenditures related to disaster and climate change adaptation with a particular focus on their interlinked aspects between DRR and CCA. Um, countries have undertaken climate and DRR related budget tagging and expenditure, expenditure tracking with multiple objectives in mind, uh, mostly uh, to increase budget transparency and accountability and to track and monitor for decision-making and budget allocations and to identify financing gaps and available resources. In most countries, responsibilities for designing and implementing climate and disaster budget tagging initiatives were shared between the ministers of finance and ministries of environment. Across all the countries we examined for this study, there was a lack of clarity on the exact role and level of involvement uh, of disaster risk management agencies in designing climate budget tagging initiatives. Country definitions and scope of DRR and climate change adaptation expenditures also var varied widely within and across different regions, but majority of countries reviewed for the study follow objective or policy-based definitions and capture both recurrent and investment expenditure. And most countries capture multiple sectors given the cross-sectoral nature of climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction, and they include sub-national level expen expenditures. Transfers to public-private entities, mainly state-owned enterprises, were also identified in a number of countries we have reviewed. We have uh, taken a very in-depth look at how the overlaps between DRR and climate change adaptation are addressed in the countries. The overlaps and common objectives are recognized in various degrees in uh, different national policy frameworks. For instance, at least 13 countries, mostly from the Pacific, have adopted a joint climate change and DRR uh, strategy or action plan. We see that in the EU, EU, there has been a lot of progress also to define the overlaps and commonalities between DRR and CCA, especially at the level of policies, strategies, and investment planning. For instance, most EU countries are implementing measures to ensure that investments are resilient to future disaster risks through environmental impact assessments, and national risk assessments now include climate considerations. As, uh, at the same time, reporting guidelines on disaster risk management also consider climate change adaptation strategies. Beyond this strategic and policy level integration of DRR and CCA, we also found emerging experiences in pursuing integrated approach to DRR and CCA in, in, in the process of public expenditure review and budget tagging reforms, reforms in particular in a number of African countries. Among uh, over 40 countries we have reviewed, there is only one country that tags negative contribution to climate objectives annually. A few countries in Europe were found to assess the harmful impacts of subsidies. In the case of climate and disaster resilience finance, subnational level and local level coverage is of particular important, as, as we know that uh, DRR and climate change adaptation implementation largely lies at this local level of governance. So the important role of local governments in climate adaptation and DRR finance is clearly demonstrated in the Philippines and other countries we have examined on this study. We, in our analysis, we also found some emerging practices in uh, capturing private sector related expenditures and revenues. Many countries in Europe and Latin America apply climate tags to transfers to state-owned enterprises 
while there seems to be limited evidence in Africa and Asia. Uh, but several countries in Europe and Latin America have experience with issuance of sovereign green bonds, which included DR and climate change adaptation related expenditures. In most countries, climate related budget reporting captures budget allocations rather than expenditure. As we know, whether or not uh, this report, uh, budget uh, tracking reports, expenditure reviews, whether they capture only allocation or, or include expenditure can make a huge difference in the accuracy of reporting on how much is actually spent on climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction. In terms of classifying and estimating relevant budget lines, countries normally would use either a binary approach or rely on a relative classification or estimation approach to distinguish whether a program or activity is fully or partially supporting climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction. Most countries reviewed under this paper use relative estimation approaches and weights to classify shares of total program as climate change adaptation or DRR related. And these are often building on the OECD doc real marker or the climate expenditure review methodology. Importantly, most of the countries analyzed across different regions do not still have a standard tags or codes to reflect consistency with DRR and climate change adaptation policy. To our knowledge, none of the countries we have uh, reviewed has an operational process for budget tagging and tracking in place to reflect common policy objectives and overlaps in expenditure across disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation. These findings reveal still a uh, you know, huge uh, political institutional capacity and technical challenges uh, related to climate and disaster uh, budget tagging and public expenditure tracking. Based on this analysis of global and country experiences, we are proposing under this, as you can see in this issue paper, a set of recommendations to enhance the effectiveness and benefits of climate change adaptation and DRR related budget tagging. Uh, one of the first recommendations and uh, an important factor uh, of success is about political will. So the motivation and the decision to design and implement climate and disaster related budget tagging should be backed up by strong political will and should be linked to national policy and legal frameworks. The leadership by finance and planning ministries is essential for ensuring these public expenditures are consistent with national climate and disaster policies. And tagging and tracking initiatives, we have to also be very mindful of the fact that budget tagging and expenditure tracking alone cannot improve uh, DRR and CCA finance uh, and policy effectiveness alone on its own. It is important to consider complementary measures when planning and uh, tagging and tracking initiatives, such as integrating climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction into environmental impact assessments, or long-term fiscal sustainability analysis or cost-benefit analysis. And uh, another important uh, factor that we strongly recommend is to have a very clear institutional arrangement and an accountability framework. These are critical success factors, especially given the overlaps between climate change adaptation and DRR and the cross-cutting nature. So the well-coordinated integrated DRR and CCA budget tagging and tracking can help identify areas of convergence, thus improve the coordination and reduce duplication. Gaining Sorry, broader Sunday, public... Just to say three minutes left. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Gaining broader public support is also very important, especially for instance, through wider engagement with civil society groups, building political pressure for meeting the DRR and climate change financing needs. And adequate capacity development support uh, is also critical as a part of the climate change and disaster budget taking and tracking initiative and further guidance and targeted capacity development also at the level of line ministries and local governments is also a critical factor. We see that the based on the review, uh, we see that there's still a huge need for a, a more robust and clear definition of expenditure on climate and disaster resilience, especially important for tagging secondary and indirect climate and DRR expenditure. In some cases also, the benefit, uh, we, we, uh, we have seen that in some country expenditure reviews, the benefits of positive expenditure could be actually outweighed by the harmful effects of negative expenditure. So we see uh, there is a clear need at the global level to consider how negative expenditure can be better identified and tracked. Finally, uh, 
Uh, my final point is just to highlight that, uh, you know, this work on climate change adaptation and DRR um, budget tagging and tracking is uh, directly relevant to loss and damage finance discussions. Uh, addressing loss and damage, uh, you know, would require a comprehensive risk management approach connecting DRR, climate change adaptation, and humanitarian actions, and uh, with the better understanding of the limits to adaptation and unavoidable loss and damage. Integrated and coordinated budget tagging and tracking of climate change adaptation and DRR could actually be uh, helpful in terms of um, uh, supporting countries' capacity to reduce avoidable risk and also relieve financial constraints to tackling unavoided risks. Uh, so this will be a critical contributor towards transparency and accountability in loss and damage finance as well. Uh, I will just conclude that further international cooperation is uh, critical needed to strengthen this uh, coordinated DRR and climate change adaptation tagging and public uh, expenditure management initiatives. And we look forward to uh, partnering and exploring collaboration with different international partners uh, uh, going forward. Thank you. Great, thanks on me. Um, really comprehensive pr presentation and you're able to um, download the paper and get all the details from that. You'll see the uh, the 40 countries reviewed that Sonmi referred to. And uh, But one of the key points Sonmi made is the importance of capacity uh, development on what is, uh, as you will see, a relatively technical subject. Although as Mathieu was stressing at the beginning, it has a very um, applied practical uh, uh, need in the real world for increasing disaster prevention finance, uh, given the huge payoffs of that compared to uh, the enormous costs of disaster response. Um, okay, so the next uh, uh, presentation will be a little bit shorter by Yasin, who's a PFM consultant, a public financial management consultant uh, based in West Africa, and she'll present on uh, a methodology which you can hopefully apply in your own country for taking this work forward. So Yasin, you have five minutes. Thank you, Paul. Good afternoon, everyone. So as Paul mentioned, we will present uh, the, method the methodology that we're suggesting for um, a coordinated budget tagging initiative that addresses both DOR and CPA. So as a starting point, it's important to see the method as a how-to guide and on the experiences, uh, practices, and lessons learned from the countries that were analyzed in the issue paper. And it should also be read uh, um, with the taxonomy that will be presented next by my colleague, Dina. So one key point before getting into the elements that are to be taken into consideration for the methodology is to acknowledge that um, this reform is a costly one, and it's important for countries to understand that they need to assess the, accept, the expected benefits from adopting um, this coordinated budget tagging initiative and compare it to the cost uh, incurred. So we've come up with seven elements which uh, we can kind of follow through from um, the presentation on the issue paper and these elements next slide please these elements should not be read as a in a chronological order but rather as um overlapping uh, overlapping um elements that uh, are to be undertaken so the first one is on leadership and coordination and it entails on knowing what are the institutions that have uh, a dor cc mandate what are they, their exact mandates? What are the roles? How do they work together? And more importantly, which, is, which institution takes the lead in designing and uh, undertaking such an approach? Um, the second element, which I can see is flowing in the Q&R is on definitions. So what are we counting as someone asked? What are the, how are the international definitions of DRR and CC adapted to local context? and what are the areas of, over, of overlap. And when we look at scope, what is the level of tagging that we're looking at um, and how, uh, what type of expenditures are we including? Are they only positive or negative? And how does uh, this joint approach of uh, tagging DRR and CTA, how does it fit in with tagging other prospecting um, in, uh, sectors such as gender or children's rights? 
The third element is on the objectives. Um, it's important to acknowledge that different stakeholders will have different objectives and all these objectives need to be taken into account. And also um, there needs to be a highlight on the value added of the joint approach. And uh, as uh, Sion said, how does um, the DCBT fit in with other international initiatives? Fourth element is on reporting and dissemination. So this is what are we, how, what are we reporting in what format? How does the reporting fit in with the budget cycle? And um, how do we disseminate the results that we have? Um, who do we disseminate? We, do we dis disseminate it to and how often do we do so? Um, other element, fifth element is on capacity assessment. Um, as Paul mentioned, a capacity is a key point of undertaking um, DCBT because um, civil servants or even practitioners are at the forefront of that. So it starts with first assessing what are, what are the capacities that are existing and then putting it in place a capacity building plan. This, the implication for this is that depending on the capacity you have, then you will limit or expand the scope of um, the tagging that you want to implement. Sixth element is on content and phasing. So content is most mostly on um, the methodology that is used for the tagging. Uh, there are several methodologies that could be used and we'll go a bit further on that in the taxonomy. And the phasing is on acknowledging that this is a complex reform and it's a, at a crossroads between the budget, PFM, the PFM cycles, environment and climate issues. So what, and disasters and disaster as well. So it's important to start um, maybe with a pilot and then uh, add on, build on um, an increase um, uh, on the scope that's being undertaken. And the last point and the last element is on monitoring, monitoring and learning. So there needs to be a clear plan for monitoring, monitoring learning, uh, knowledge uh, management approach uh, with really specific aspects that describe how is this um, how are the results relevant? Are they effective? Are they efficient? What is the sustainability of these results? And most importantly, what's the impact of this joint tagging initiative on different elements such as poverty reduction or even um, other budgetary um, objectives? And what are the lessons learned for our countries? So as I've said in conclusion, these seven elements are key factors to take into account when a country is designing or undertaking a joint tagging on DOR and DCA. Thank you. Great, thanks Yassine. Really clear um, explanation of, um, of the proposed methodology. And I should say that while the, uh, the, the report that Sonmi presented at the beginning has now been completed and is available for download, the, uh, this methodology is still in draft. So if you feel anything's missing or you think anything's could be improved or you think it's, it, it doesn't fit your country context, please tell us in the discussion and, and comment section, which we'll have in a moment, and we can amend the, uh, the methodology um, accordingly because we want it to be as practical and useful as countries as, as can be. Now we come on to this issue of taxonomy. How do you define when you're trying to do climate, combined climate and disaster budget tagging, or you'll see, you'll see in the presentations the CB, um, uh, DCBT acronym, uh, or um, how do you define what is a climate expenditure or what is a disaster expenditure? A couple of the questions you'll see in the chat relate to this. Um, have you analyzed in your research whether countries include transboundary cooperation and then second question from Fiona is, were the obvious differences between countries as what they classified as adaptation? So clearly participants on this webinar are interested in this issue, which is at the core of this uh, methodology. So now, um, Lena, you have five minutes to very quickly introduce what is quite a complicated and emerging taxonomy, also still in draft. So we welcome comments, Lena. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, Yassine. Um, so this taxonomy, taxonomy aspect of the project relates most 
closely to that sixth element that Yassine spoke about, the content part of the methodology. So it's not, it, it should be seen as, as an integral part or a supporting element of the methodology uh, as a whole, really. Um, and the taxonomy specifically, um, as such, aims to support comprehensive budget tagging. So um, to it aims to provide some of the clarity, as Paul mentioned, about um, the uh, common objectives and overlaps versus differences in climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction, um, budget allocations, um, and to support the, the, the budget tagging and expenditure tracking processes. Um, it's really meant to be a practical tool uh, that supports users, for example, in ministries of finance who aim to do this on an annual basis as part of the budget cycle or um, uh, you know, external mm -hmm. advisors or review processes that aim to assess um, and track uh, ex public expenditure against um, disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation, which could be done also not as an annual exercise, but as a one-off um, evaluation or review process, for instance. Um, and so it aims to serve those, those different purposes. Um, the content of the taxonomy and how it's defined and developed is really based on a review of existing approaches of um, taxonomies and classifications and methodologies that are already in use. Um, that focus either on climate change adaptation or mitigation or disaster risk reduction um, uh, expenditure. Um, so, for example, Sonmi mentioned the OECD DUC uh, Rio marker and DRR policy marker, the EU taxonomy. And so these are all approaches that already exist that we've reviewed and that we've used to, um, that, that we are now in the process of using to define and flesh out this taxonomy. Um, as Paul said, it's quite a, a technical and a complex exercise and it's work in progress. And we're aiming to have a version of this available in May. Um, so if you are specifically interested in the taxonomy aspect, please do get in touch. We'd uh, love to engage and exchange um, as there are other initiatives ongoing trying to do similar things or, or relating to, to this sort of work. So please do, do reach out if, if this is of interest. Um, I won't go into all of the technical details, but I will briefly present the four cornerstones that we are using to define and shape out the taxonomy. So again, this is based on the issue paper and the broader methodology approach. Um, and the these are the, the four aspects, the four cornerstones that we, um, based on this review, felt are particularly important to reflect in the taxonomy so that it can be useful and that it can be that practical tool that's helpful to do um, disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation, budget tagging and expenditure tracking in practice. Um, the first cornerstone is that the taxonomy uh, would, add, together with the methodology as a whole, need to address political demand. So it should, in its language and its approach linked to disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation strategies globally. So we're using the Sendai framework, of course, and the Paris Agreement as the global reference points, but recognizing um, that there is national and regional um, policy and plans in place that this would potentially need to speak to and be adaptable to as well. Um, it should help uh, strengthen evidence to build confidence against international funds and also, um, if possible, uh, include um, provisions that can help display the negative expenditure or expenditure that, that does no significant harm um, in a way that's constructive as um, as Sonny highlighted earlier in her presentation of the issue paper findings. The second main cornerstone is that the taxonomy would need to support credibility um, of the approach overall um, so that it would help encourage common approaches, um, common meaning can great, contribute towards greater coherence at the global level in how um, climate and disaster budget uh, is tagged and expenditure is tracked but without being too prescriptive, so with this, um, with this inherent flexibility so that it can be useful and adapted to different country contexts. Um, it should respond to need for clarity um, and this need for uh, definitions on what is common DRR and climate change adaptation versus what responds to either or the other policy objectives. Um, and it should also, as far as possible, um, include arrangements to avoid greenwashing and overestimation of uh, disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation expenditure to, to support credibility and accountability. The third major cornerstone is that it should 
align with available capacity. Um, so uh, again, the major point in the review of global experience as part of the issue paper is that um, between countries, but also within countries, between ministries and between the national and local level, there, there can be quite vast differences in terms of the the, the capa uh, capacity, the resources available to implement these sorts of exercises. So um, the priority in the de design of the taxonomy is to keep it simple. Um, we're using this uh, DAC plus uh, term to indicate that we're building on the OECD DAC Rio marker and um, disaster risk reduction policy marker as an approach, but expanding this and providing various options um, to expand it in different directions based on countries' needs and objectives for disaster and climate budget tagging and tracking. Um, a core component of the taxonomy will be a reference table uh, with a lot of practical examples um, that aims to help guide uh, the user in how to classify different types of activities and expenditures um, and to simplify classification, essentially. Um, and as much as possible, uh, we're also aiming to build on existing budget reforms. And then lastly, the fourth major cornerstone is that it should um, set a manageable scope. And this is, of course, very closely related to available capacity, but also to the objectives of why a country or uh, a, another um, entity, another actor might be interested in implementing this sort of um, exercise. And so flexibility really is a key guiding principle in how the taxonomy is um, designed. Um, to be able to respond to different objectives and um, be applicable at different levels of government as well. Um, so practically how we're doing this or what we're doing in the taxonomy is to have a, a core approach, a core system that's kept relatively simple, but with different um, uh, building blocks or add-ons uh, that provide options so that the user um, can choose from those building blocks uh, specific um, specific elements that uh, they might want to look into more closely with regards to um, where uh, budget allocations go, um, either as part of DCBT, so as annual disaster and climate budget tagging and tracking, or as a, a as a more extended potentially um, budget uh, public expenditure and institutional review that is maybe not done annually, but that could look into some of the um, uh, some of the finance elements in more detail and so could have different requirements and therefore um, we're, we're providing options for how the core approach could be expanded in those directions. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Uh, again, if this is something you're very interested in uh, specifically, please do feel free to reach out and I'll now pass back to Paul to hear more about country experiences in detail. Thank you. Great, thanks Lena. And as we, as as you, she said, please uh, reach out to us in the team if you want to engage more. So now we're very pleased to have with us um, two senior colleagues from government, who will give their brief perspectives before we open it out to hopefully an interactive audience discussion. And I'm actually going to try and call upon some people in the audience to comment. Uh, maybe starting with Sheila Patel. So Sheila, if you can be ready with your comments, I'll give you a couple of minutes once we open it out for discussion. Um, so, but before that, we have, we're very pleased to have with us Nazira from the Ministry of Finance in um, Mozambique based in Maputo. So hopefully uh, you, uh, your internet will be strong enough for us to uh, even see you in Maputo and you can share with us your experience as the disaster management focal point in the Ministry of Finance. Uh, Nazira, you have the floor for seven minutes, please. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank, uh, thanks the organizer for giving Mozambique the opportunity to participate in this event, and especially to be able to share and learn of the other countries in this field. Uh, as you know, Mozambique, due to this geographical location, is the most line in the ex existence of extensive areas of altitude through sea level 
and uh, is a country that uh, is uh, cyclically affected by extreme events such as a throw, floods, storms, and the tropical cyclones. This is uh, aggravated in recent years by increasing regularity and the phenomena. In the last 40 years, 25 tropical cyclones of very varying intensity have hit Mozambique, uh, such as 56% uh, of uh, which were category three. Uh, uh, ranking from uh, uh, to, uh, 154 uh, kilometers per hour to 101 kilometers per hour. So, in recent decades, the impact of extreme events have been significant, with implication for the state budget, social and economy welfare, causing the government's efforts to economic development in the country. The states uh, do have the challenges in recent years. The government has been carrying out a series of reforms to improve disaster risk management, which is a national priority. In this context, it has adopted disaster risk reduction and prevention policies, uh, such as a national climate change adaptation and mitigation strategy for 2013 until 2025. And um, other policy I can mention now, the Disaster Management Fund uh, that was approved in 2017, which include among the, amongst revenues, uh, the, the allocation of uh, at least 0.42 percent of tax revenue annually in the state budget. So regardless of the planning and the uh, budgeting process, Mozambique, this activity is developed by the National Directorate of Planning and uh, Budgeting, which is by, based in the Ministry of Economy and Finance. This directorate has among mission to develop methodology on the process of planning and the budgeting through a single methodological guide to deal different sector, whether at central, provincial, distrital, even municipality level, on how they should plan their action, including cross-cutting action where the aspect related to the risk reduction and adaptation climatic change gender, sustainable development goals, and uh, so on are uh, integrated. So the Minister of uh, Environment uh, in our country is the sector that coordinates and plans the action related to the climate change adaptation. And uh, the Institute for Risk Management, that's the one that coordinates and plans the actions for disaster risk reduction. And these actions are easily visualized in this part. Uh, in 2010, Mozambique started with the process of programming action based on program, which means programming and budgeting by program as a way to facilitate the process and the faster effectiveness efficiency and relevant of public service, as well as monitor the action carrying out in order to achieve the objectives set out in various national and international instruments that country has ratified. The planning uh, by programming is a strategy adopted in order to identify the budget involved in the various programs, including the transversal programs 
um, of which the action for the adaptation and mitigation of climate change and the DRR are parts and all sectors are called upon to embrace this cause, integrate them within the Asian Day sector mandate. However, it was found that at the time of planning, only the coordinating sector, uh, the Minister of Environment, is the one that planned and coordinated action to respond to the CCI and DDR programs. And other sectors such as health, education, and other ones, even though they carry out action to respond to this aspect, do not plan this in the program phase, making difficult to access the budget plans and executed in area. We understand that the process of budget uh, uh, taking and tracking can help nation to better track the budget involved for prog uh, programmed action, especially action in areas uh, such as agenda, SDGs, uh, Air and DRR, for example. Usually, these actions have international support as they are covered by international agreements and targets. In our country, the process of uh, budget tracking and um, tracking of action um, related to climate change adaptation mitigation and uh, DR has not yet been initiated. The country still does not have appropriate means to classify and track the budget in a coherent way, and uh, would need some learning, some training, and the exchange of experience with other countries that are already implementing this issue in order to allow better control from the planning process to action, and especially if these actions are carrying out to meet the objective set. Uh, currently, we do not have control to the budget involved in the CCA and RRD. We can only visualize the programmed in the specific sector. Uh, therefore, at the level of the action of Minister of Environment, and uh, also uh, at the national disaster reduction management. Since these are the sectors that plan and coordinate this activity. The other different sectors, uh, although they also carry out activities related to the CCA and ARR, uh, it's um, uh, a bit uh, difficult to visualize Um, uh, in parallel to this, uh, last year, the country has started uh, with the tagging process in issue like related to the indicator that respond to the sustainable development goals and the nation, national determinant contribution. So it's a process that's still in experimental phases. So, in spite of having integrated the end action, the balance is still done outside of the system. It's done separately from where the data may not be at some point. So, uh, in some ways, our uh, state budget contemplates uh, disaster research action but not in a way that is easy. So um, it's our expectation that in the medium term, country will adopt a, a, a methodology or some taxonomy to facilitate the tracking of related to the CCA and the, the DRR. Uh, one, on one hand, to ensure budget coherence and support fiscal transparency. And uh, on the other hand, to help track the specified policy. 
So uh, this is our uh, yes, Mozambique. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Nazira, for your um, clear and frank assessment of both the challenges and the way uh, you're hoping to overcome them in Mozambique. So now we're pleased to invite uh, Xavier uh, Pava to join from uh, Colombia to give his experience. Maybe you could turn on your camera if you can, Xavier, and uh, share with us um, your experience. Uh, and I please be a uh, as quick as you can, given that we have a limited amount of time and we want to maximize discussion. So, Xavier, could you share your experience, please? Bueno, a ver, eh... bueno, lo primero, Thank you very much, uh, Primero. I want to share with you the experience in Colombia. We have been developing for designation of resources for CI there from what has been done in the development of the resources and financing of the reduction of disasters, risks, disaster risks. The way that we materialize the, the climate change and the situation and the important financial resources to answer the humanitarian question. Uh, many expenditures that have been demanded in the country to establish a strategy to of financial protection that includes actions such as retention, transference, many of those in terms of what would be credits and insurance. And also this resources allocation allowed us to see not only we have new resources but they are regulating in the national system system but we have start to develop a planning of the public financial some cost, uh, this is a very important thing incorporates the question of uh, risks and the strategic planning. These are projects that has to do with the subject of uh, planning, the of development, of investment, and of organization. This strategic planification is um, long-term in the country that allows um, projects about the climate change. And the other thing has got to do with the planning, operative. It's the process of formulation and execution in relation to the projects. It's included the variable of risks that we guarantee that the investments that are done and in specific projects have the risk variety. This is, these are the things that are developing in our country. Today, we do a balance according to the markers and indicators to invest a national on international. The most part of it is done directly to projects of managing risks and disasters and specifically uh, uh, recovering to invest in the recovery of the risks. We manage in an important way the national union that I represent and in the last years managed to get an important value and resources for the managing of risks. 
not only to solve problems, structural problems, but also the prospective risks. What we are wanting today is to reduce the risk. The CAA is what guarantees that these investments or the expenditure be effective, sustainable. Nowadays, more than ever, we have it clear that we need this, and we have in this government of the President Gustavo Pedro in Colombia, uh, more than we should, we are articulated with the climate change and all the actions of risk reduction and the recovering is our focus on the adaptation. Not only we search, we want to solve the, the problems there, but also the structural problems. To resolve the inequality gaps and the poverty, which are the fundamental uh, causes of this, we are in a logic that we have a cycle. A cycle of the risk mitigation. Professionals that want more investments, more. Uh, more fiscalization, and we have been having a complete situation. Many times they talk about the scenes, about many resources and the risk system corruption. That's why one of the strategies today about the public investments got to do with this aspect that includes on a correct planning and, and a social participation and something to look after the investments. The assignment of resources in an organized and planned way is effective, not only in terms of costs and benefits, but cost efficiency so that these measures resolve in an effective way that what we call today corrective or reactive investments that are to solve the problem. We're going to... This is an important part of what we've been doing. We think that this experience is really can be done with the participation of other countries. And with the subject, we can't see the investment on managing of risks and the actions of the climate change is something that we see it's very complex very elaborate uh, many times leave us with no action those investments that need to be done in a planned way and you have to find a middle point in what we're doing Porque están tan pensadas en términos de atención. Hay que buscar ese punto. Tiene que buscar este punto. Uh, you have to search for this middle point. Search for investments that can solve the problems. And that once you see the problem, but also to be aimed at solve the problem, the, po the population that need. Generally, the balance that we've been done in Colombia, many times great inversions, investments is reduced in services and benefits that are very reduced. 
a los contratistas o a los grandes proveedores. Entonces, esta es una discusión. Es, this is something that seems to be very good about this thing, not only about the assignation of the financial and how this public expenditure is converted in an effective way to sort out the structural problems that today more than ever establish that needs to develop. And, and if you need me, I'm here. If you need it, if you have any question. Thank you very much, Xavier Pava. Really interesting to hear how in a complicated political setup, this approach provides some sort of rational uh, allocation of resources. So now, thank you for listening. I know we've, you've, we've given you a lot of material, but now this is your chance to contribute to the discussion. So please ask your questions. You can also raise your hand in the, uh, in the, in the, uh, if you want to speak. Well, I see two hands up. I don't know if you're seeing them. Okay, let me see. Oh, uh, well, Xavier yeah. is one, so we've heard from him already. Who was the second one? So there are two people in the, on the attendees. Uh, David Benjamin is one, and then the second name, uh, I'm struggling uh, to pronounce it correctly, but Jaganatha, I believe so. so. Okay, well, David Benjamin, would you like to go first, please, and introduce yourself? Yes, hi. Um, I am a um, entrepreneur in Norway, and uh, we build um, systems um, that uh, help with disaster risk reduction by using nature-based solutions. So my question is directed to the IIED, especially um, I'm wondering how they um, uh, put into the criteria for uh, their taxonomy um the efficacy of the actual measures that they that are uh, evaluated what how is efficacy measured because that's quite complex good question david thank you we won't answer that straight away we'll just see if there are any other uh questions from the audience so um shivaranjani i don't know whether you're still on the line from uh, from the opm team based in india are you on the line, Shivaranjani? Would you like to ask your question? Uh, thanks um, for waiting. Um, I had placed my uh, question on the Q&A box, but thanks for the opportunity. Um, this has been a very interesting um, sharing of uh, some preliminary findings of a global review. So thanks for taking the effort uh, today. Uh, my question is around whether the study team had an opportunity to observe um, while they focused on uh, reviewing countries on DBT, that is uh, disaster-related uh, budget tagging, uh, or policies that integrate uh, DRR uh, into planning and budgeting, whether the team actually observed uh, any significant difference as to uh, inclusion of you know, pre versus post disaster-related uh, expenditures or even planned allocations. Um, so uh, along the DRM cycle, um, uh, so there is a pre-disaster preparedness or uh, risk reduction initiatives or mitigation initiatives and post-disaster response, rehabilitation, recovery oriented uh, initiatives. So whether the team actually observed any anything distinctive about that in the coverage of what countries integrate in the name of DRR uh, mainstream. Thank you so much. Thanks, Shivaranjani. Then we have uh, Jagannatha. Jagannatha, do you want to go ahead? Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I have a very simple question. Uh, as a practitioner in the National Disaster Management in India, way back in 2010, I got uh, trained as a master trainer in disaster management in NIDM, National Institute of Disaster Management. And I've been following COP 2627 as a virtual invitee by UNDP. My question is very simple. Unless there is a validation of these uh, uh, plannings, you know, they are very good planning. Uh, strategies are there, very good. But I want to say that 1991 was a watershed in uh, community enabling. That is IUCN, 
UNEP and WWF came up with a document called uh, Caring for Earth, a strategy for sustainable living. And I'm a student of uh, uh, UNDRR for a long time with best practices documented so well. So my question is very simple. Shouldn't we think of taking these uh, theoretical, uh, very nice, you know, knowledgeable and practical uh, plannings for a validation? wherein we look at the civic societies and also the endangered population. So I can close by saying that uh, Swedish International Water Institute 2021, when we had a WMO, I was invited for some reviews of the nature and community-based uh, initiatives. We come very clearly, uh, there is uh, a certain rhythm of uh, the local uh, stakeholders, especially the academics, uh, the local bodies and uh, voluntary groups, a lot and lot, a lot of uh, convergence is taking place. Okay. I think we need to Thanks, look at... Jagannath. Sorry, in the interest of time, I'm going to have to stop you there. So we get Thank you very much. I think I've conveyed con con my point. Very simply, we should validate it. Thank you. Thank you, Jagannath. I think it's a very good point. And I think Sheila, if she'd been here, would have also stressed the importance of community engagement. And I think our next uh, question or commentator, David, Satterthwaite is well known on this uh, community-based issue. So David, over to you to ask your question or give your comment. Hi there, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Well, as a friend of um, Sheila Patel going back 30 years, I will try and answer for her as well as for me. Where's money gonna come from for adaptation? Well, in informal settlements, which house maybe a billion and a quarter people, it's their, their investment, their community investment, their individual investment, and the local government investment. And these are hugely important. Many of the cities, you know, cities didn't get mentioned. Many of the city governments with the best disaster risk reduction didn't need national government or international agencies. They did it themselves as part of the their responsibility as, as governing the city. Um, perhaps most remarkable funding for grassroots organizations is local funds established in particular cities on which they can draw, where they meld very nicely upgrading for informal settlements with provision for disaster risk reduction and, oh, how are risks changing with climate? How do we add those? So we, 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 we've got lots of um, fantastic examples. I'm not sure we learn from them. Great, thanks, David. And I, it's good to have a community perspective which, in the context of a very national approach, which I think maybe has been taken so far. Um, but the final person I'd just like to invite is someone who works in the UK on the Climate Committee. I saw uh, Bagabi, um, from the UK Climate Committee. Are you still on the call? And would you like to comment in the context of what's happening in the UK as a developed country and whether any of this work is relevant to you? Well, I can't see their name in the participants okay. list, unfortunately. Okay. Okay, so maybe we've had a set of questions, of a lot on community issues, a lot on um, this issue of whether what the data is telling us about the spending on disaster preparedness as opposed to response, which um, was the framing that Mathieu set out, and then the efficacy of the interventions. So I'm going to invite maybe the IIED team, uh, Sonmi, Lina, or Yassine. Would any of you uh, like to answer maybe just one of those questions each? Sonmi, would you like to go first? Hey, thanks a lot. And thank you so much for all the very uh, thought provoking um, questions and comments. Um, given the scope of this study, we could not really get into the detailed analysis of uh, each uh, country's adaptation and DRR related budget, uh, budget tags and codes in, in terms of the content. But in term, uh, as a response to the question from our colleague, I think it was OPM India, into, uh, they have the disaster uh, risk and disaster risk management related expenditures were captured. So from our uh, country reviews, the, at the current level is basically the 
climate change adaptation related budget tagging uh, in most country cases do include disaster uh, risk reduction related actions. For instance, an example would be um, disaster risk management is identified and uh, suggested as a category of climate change adaptation expenditure, uh, in which would include early warning and emergency response systems. And these are included as part of the climate change adaptation budget uh, in some of the countries. And for instance, in the case of the Philippines, um, DRR and climate change adaptation are included as part of the um, disaster uh, budget, as well as climate change uh, budget guidelines for local governments across different sectors, whether it's food security or uh, health. Um, so yeah, so it, it interchangeably used. However, as we noted in the recommendation, there's definitely a need for a much more robust and clear uh, definition and standardized methodology for um, capturing uh, both uh, climate change adaptation and DRR and across the different uh, the, disaster risk um, related budgeting uh, processes of climate uh, disaster mitigation, preparedness, as well as response and recovery. There's definitely a need for a more robust and standardized methodology for more countries can, to, to use and to be able to, for us to be able to also compare uh, different country level data. That's maybe some of the um, responses great. we can give. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Yasin, would you like to pick a question, maybe the one on communities, if uh, how the methodology could pick that up in, in a future iteration, or whether it's beyond um, the scope? Um, okay, sure. On the communities, yes, I think it's a very important point. And uh, when we talk about institutional arrangement, um, I think we should maybe widen the thinking and not think about only public institutions, but also look at uh, organizations that are non-governmental, whether they're international organizations or NGOs or uh, community groups, and see how they can be integrated into the discussion. Um, this is something that's come across in, in other countries' experiences, and the voice of non-government actors is being taken into account. Uh, especially for reporting and also a greater accountability in, in budget management. Thanks, uh, Yasin. And then finally, Lena, um, would you like to respond, take this question on efficacy of interventions? Uh, yeah, sure. I'll just make a quick addition also to what Sonmi said on and, and this question about uh, pre and post. So we didn't look at this um, specifically uh, in, in detail as part of this review, but um, I think Mathieu mentioned a couple of figures in his introductory remarks actually. So what we know from global um, databases that record international aid spending is that this the, the, the aid money really is skewed towards response rather than risk reduction and preparedness activities. And so within the OECD DAC uh, classification framework, for example, there is you know, there is a categorization for how to, to split that up. And it's not something that we did in detail as part of the issue paper, but it is certainly something that's been discussed uh, in depth and uh, different options are being considered for how we could reflect this in the taxonomy approach so that um, at the country level, we can support greater transparency um, on where the money goes uh, along the disaster risk management cycle as well. So that's um, that's a well noted point and something that is very much part of the discussion on how the taxonomy and the methodology evolve. Um, and then this other uh, point that um, was raised by David, I think, on the um, uh, the effectiveness. Um, so this is something we've been discussing under the the headline or the the, the categories of. Um, whether we're proposing outcome-based classification or objective-based classification. So are we categorizing an activity based on what its stated objective is at the start of the activity or what its eventual um, demonstrated outcome will have been? And as I mentioned, um, as one of the cornerstones, this issue of practicality and being able to uh, implement the taxonomy and use it in the context of differing different levels of capacity. Um, what we are proposing as the, the basic, the, the kind of core approach is an objective-based classification because it, as David, I think himself mentioned, the, the kind of outcome-based approach is a much, much more complex one and one that is 
um, likely not feasible as a, as a standardized element or, or something that's done on an annual basis, for example, as part of the budget cycle, at least not, not in all contexts. And so, um, but, but recognizing the importance of the effectiveness um, uh, issue or, or um, understanding effectiveness and, and uh, ensuring that um, there is accountability on that. And as well, one of the add-ons that we are proposing in the taxonomy um, is uh, to uh, basically look at this as an outcome-based classification. Um, if the user decides that that's the objective and that that's feasible and a feasible approach to do, for example, in the context of a one-off um, public expenditure and institutional review process where additional capacity can be brought on and where more time is potentially also available to implement that exercise. Um, so the standard approach is objective-based, but we are providing options for how uh, the taxonomy could be used in an outcome-based classification approach. Great, thanks, Lena. And I noticed there were a, a bunch of questions in the Q&A which um, many of which have been covered in the discussion, but if if the response if the panelists Lena particularly Lena Yassin and Sonmi want to type in answers in the in the closing few minutes to uh, to the questions that would be good in the chat box or in the Q and A box rather. So now we have three more minutes left. So Mathieu, over to you to give the uh, final closing remarks. Yeah, thank you, Paul, and and thank you for the discussion. I think it was. Extremely interesting to to hear the, the views and, and and thank you also for for the participant who ask questions. I think it's always helpful to have that feedback and uh, helps uh, to us to to further improve uh, what we're working on. Um, I mean, in the closing, uh, I think what we what we are envisaging from now is of course trying to see. Um, work on, on the two uh, uh, future elements of of, of the work uh, that is related to, to budget tagging and tracking, which is, as as you mentioned during this call, the methodology and the taxonomy, which is really about how to bring this uh, uh, to country implementation. And I think that's what we are planning to do at UNDR is to work with a selected number of countries once the methodology is developed, once uh, we have the taxonomy in place, to really try to pilot or work with, with countries who are interested in this topic uh, to, to apply this methodology and, and benefit from it. So we, of course, have uh, regional offices uh, in different regions, in, in Africa, in Asia, and, and others, who are planning uh, to carry on this work. So it's very important that we get this methodology and taxonomy right, so it can really maximize the benefit for, for countries using it. So, so we'll, we're really looking forward to, to work on, on these next steps, and, and we'll try to incorporate as much as possible any feedback that we will be receiving between between now and then um, so so with this i think it's uh, been a really great uh, great opportunity and uh, and a great engagement so uh, so we'll be organizing uh, further uh, events uh, when uh, when we have those uh, additional uh, document ready uh, for sharing so uh, so please stay uh, uh, stay alert and see uh, and, and try to participate in, in, in future events that we'll be organizing on this topic so that will be my uh, closing but thanks again for uh, for everyone uh, who was uh, here with us and for to the IED team for, for the great work and as well for to, to all my colleagues who have contributed to, to this and, and other international organizations who also have been uh, uh, participating actively in, in this discussion thank you and as, of course again to, to the country representative who were here today um thank you right okay so goodbye everybody have a good day evening morning thank bye. you bye, bye.